Welcome to today's session. My name is uh, Laura Hill and I head up Cloud Essentials in the, the UK region. So this session today is part of quite a regular series that we run of webinars and events around Microsoft Purview, the, the, the features that Microsoft gives you to create the conditions for compliance, conditions for governance across sort of your, your data that you've got growing within your Microsoft Cloud environment. So the aim really with this session and uh, our content, our eBooks, our blogs is to impart some knowledge as a partner. Um, to share kind of lessons learned in a more practical way. Um, so if you've not subscribed already uh, to our content, please do so via the link. We'll put it in the chat now so that you get some regular insights uh, from our technical team and our compliance team. Um, and we're quite active on LinkedIn as well. So our profile links are there um, so you can connect with us to keep in touch. So today's session, you're going to hear from uh, two presenters representing quite different perspectives. So uh, my colleague Johan van Schalkwerk is our Microsoft 365 technical lead, and he's going to bring his um, experience today from a technical perspective around DLP. And Navasha Sanalal is our compliance and risk officer from uh, a financial background, and Navasha is going to bring her expertise from more of an assurance perspective. So I hope with today is that you leave with a bit of a sense of how you can get a quick win from deploying Microsoft data loss pre uh, prevention um, and learn from uh, some of the traps that that we've seen organizations fall into um, when tackling uh, DLP. But we also we don't want to kind of neglect the bigger picture story of protecting your data. Um, so I suppose a bit of a heads up from me on the flow of the session today, because it's a really interesting um, topic that we love talking about, but it's also quite hazardous when doing a sort of one way presentation because of a lot of terminology involved in this space. You know, there's a very um, strategic conversation to be had around protecting your information, uh, protecting your data within your Microsoft environment and beyond. But over the years, and Microsoft is certainly no exception, um, technology vendors have, have kind of coined phrases like DLP and information protection as meaning maybe more kind of tactical uh, moves that you can make a feature set. So, so Navash is going to lead us in some thinking at a sort of higher strategic level, and then we're going to channel the session into more about Microsoft DLP. So um, yeah, stick with us as we kind of unpack the topic for you. And any questions that come up, just put them into the um, into the chat as we go, and we'll tackle them at the end. So, for those who are familiar with Cloud Essentials, uh, we're a long-standing Microsoft partner around the area of content management. So, the experience that we share with you today is because of programs that we've constantly got running with with our clients, often in regulated industries to really reduce the risk profile of their content as it's growing in Microsoft 365, um, migrating and managing often high volumes of content in, in SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, email, and managing that cost effectively, and ultimately um, helping organizations to open up the value in that content using things like AI so that all this accumulated data can be surfaced to the right people, right time, you know, as knowledge um, used to business advantage really which you know you can only do responsibly if you've got these foundations in place um, from tapping into technologies like like purview so yeah we talk a lot about purview so just for clarity it's it's the name of this this family of features from microsoft that help you implement data governance help you keep your house in order help you protect your data help you improve your compliance stance and the way that you manage risk across your data and you get various um, kind of degrees of capability depending on your microsoft 365 license SKUs. and yeah it's going to give you coverage of that data that you've got in microsoft 365 um, often that's largely your unstructured data email file um, files etc but also it can extend to other data sources and this is sort of the direction microsoft is going in to, to extend that capability across other platforms and in a kind of multi-cloud way so really powerful feature sets um, but what you'll find you know with with purview adoption um, which is is kind of the the roots of the professional service that we deliver is that deployment um, for capability around compliance around governance involves a lot of people input processes at play more decision making needed around policy creation and flowing that into the technology um, so so that's why 
kind of champion collaboration between in IT and, and security professionals and assurance and risk professionals, ALP is one of those really hot topics where you kind of realise how intertwined these conversations are and, and it's often um, a starting point for organisations that are engaging with us and our professional services. And, you know, because of that sort of backdrop of complexity, that's why as a part Partner, as a Microsoft partner, we deliver our professional services around um, quite a structured methodology that we've sort of evolved over time and often deliver as part of a 12-month programme to begin with to kind of act as an extension of your compliance team and IT team um, to fill skill gaps, capacity gaps, resource gaps around purview adoption where we typically start with um, an assessment to give visibility of your current state of play across your data um, and and how you're deploying the technologies and land a roadmap for you um, and then we can work in quite a flexible way to support you with um, services at a leadership level so kind of driving the strategy around adoption and helping decision making uh, um, at a, a kind of design and deployment level, for example, uh, helping you deploy things like DLP um, and also services for proactively kind of managing purview on an ongoing basis and bringing the reports to life that you get as part of um, as part of the platform. So, yeah, the upshot of the program with Cloud Essentials is, is to kind of get you better value for money, get you quicker wins and really move the needle on on your compliance maturity um, quicker and, and more effectively than maybe you might do it alone um, doing it all in-house. So we're going to get stuck into this kind of notion now of data loss prevention and Navash is going to help kind of us get our heads around it as a as a concept, particularly from a compliance perspective. And then Johan is going to put us in the picture um, with regards to DLP as a as a Microsoft product set. Navash, do you want to take it from here? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending where you're joining us from. Um, as Laura said, I'm the legal and compliance lead for Cloud Essentials. And we're starting off with, depends who you ask, maybe a slightly controversial term uh, or topic is, what do we mean um, by DLP? Because I think this term, like many other terms, gets thrown around a lot. And for, for the purposes of our webinar and our process, we want you to be very um, specific as to what that means within our context here today. I feel like the animation has just overshot the narrative there, yes, Navasha. a little bit. <laughs> shall I? Shall, yes, please. Shall I take it back? <laughs> Uh, thank you for not saying how non-technical I am, but I think I've just demonstrated that myself. Um, <laughs> so if anyone needs a convincing, I'm definitely a legal person, not a not a tech person. So so let's get into it. Um, so if we look at the term DLP, off the bat, it means your data lo data loss prevention. But what does that actually mean? And that will change depending on who you ask, because it means different things to different people. And it has been used now for a couple of years, decades, um, and all the while, technologies and, risk, and the risk landscape has evolved around this term. So data loss prevention at its core is a security solution that identifies and helps prevent unsafe or inappropriate use uh, inappropriate sharing, transfer, use of sensitive data by using or by creating holistic controls um, that incorporate people, process, and technology. So it can help your organization monitor and protect sensitive information across on-premise systems, cloud-based applications, um, and endpoint devices. It also helps achieve compliance with regulations such as the, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, um, and the General Data Protection Regulation. So I want to really break that down because what does it actually mean? How does it help you achieve compliance with these regulations? So if we look at the GDPR, for example, let's use that here when talking about DLP specifically. As we all know, the aim of the GDPR is to protect um, citizens' private data while reinforcing their rights to protect their personal data with the ability, the GDPR also has the ability to impose a fine in the event of non-compliance. So that at its core is what it aims to do amongst other things. Um, 
and DLP solutions can help GDPR compliance by assisting a, a data controller or a processor to establish where personal information is stored by doing a data discovery, for example. DLP solutions further can help you uh, or help an organization restrict uh, restrict uploading, printing, or copying on pasting of personal data, thus minimizing the risk of data being used for purposes outside of which it was collected. So GDPR, which GDPR specifically prohibits. So using DLP companies, it allows companies to be able to monitor how data is being used and apply the relevant policies to manage this risk. So it also, and lastly, I'd like to just raise that, and definitely not least, um, DLP solutions empower an organization to be able to identify and remediate and report possible data breaches uh, more effectively and earlier than they might have been able to without such solutions. But despite this, in its current form, DLP on its own can be seen as a hindrance um, to business as it follows an allow block approach and is not intelligent enough to aid correct data usage. So there's there's often this need for a more comprehensive information protection strategy, which Laura alluded to earlier as well. So just, but however, despite some of its limitations, a big part of an information protection strategy will always be data loss prevention. Because content takes on a, a life um, a new life in modern platforms like Microsoft 365, where we collaborate and where we access information and share in a very diverse way. Data can live in many ways. So especially now as we see this, this move to AI adoption, where the premise is that information can surface itself to you as relevant knowledge as you need it. It doesn't matter where this data lives. So in the, in the world of Microsoft Purview, there are feature sets available to you to protect your data. So one of them is DLP, which we'll discuss, but what we will discuss later on is, as well is the wider information protection strategy and how DLP forms part of that. So over to you, Johan, let's, let's start with Microsoft Purview's view. Thank you, Nivasha. So looking into the Microsoft solutions that's available that you can use to protect your data, um, starting off with how you can use Microsoft Purview to protect your sensitive data. The tool set that's available for Microsoft is called information protection. And what that allows you to do is to utilize built-in sensitive information types, but most importantly, develop your own sensitive information types to then protect and classify data regardless of where it is stored. We call this the modern data loss prevention solution, whereas the protection and access control you implement with these sensitivity labels lives with the document regardless of where it is stored, whether it's shared to external trusted locations or uploaded to any SaaS platform that is also utilized outside of your Microsoft 365 eco environment. Um, so it promotes collaborative um, environment and collaboration between multiple organizations while still allowing you to control the access and rights to the content that you share using this information protection solution. The next area that Microsoft um, solution have is called insider risk management. And this addresses the risk of um, accidental or um, malicious user activities within your organization. It utilizes machine learning and templates to identify risky user behavior. As an example, uh, a user that has downloaded uh, multiple files from OneDrive or SharePoint, or even integrates within an HR system where a resignation trigger can increase the user's risk metrics within the solution so that you can apply additional controls and monitoring on top of their activities so that you can identify if there's actual uh, data being leaked or maliciously copied, copied out of your organization as part of this user behavior. The last one and the one we're focusing on today is how can you prevent data loss using Microsoft Purview data loss prevention. It is more a perimeter-based control legacy type of um, security 
defense, whereas it allows you to block certain activities from occurring to prevent data and sensitive content from leaving your organization. So it is set to identify the, the same sensitive information types that is built into information protection, but you then have abilities to enforce um, protection and block activities and actions on top of these rule sets. You can then also, and we'll jump into that, expand the integration and expand the control levels in data prevention to integrate into other Microsoft Preview advanced solution to be more granular and more flexible and um, controls that you need to implement to meet your data loss prevention requirements. So as a starting point today, I think Laura wants to ask a question on how you are doing with your data loss prevention journey. Laura, over to you. Thanks for that. Yeah, so in that kind of backdrop of what um, Microsoft DLP is at a very high level, just keen to gauge where you you are at with your journey of deploying Microsoft DLP. Um, so please, if you can, uh, scan the QR code with your phone or we'll just put the link now in the chat direct link just to cast your vote. It's it's anonymous. So just want to um, catch this. Uh, so often we kind of intercepting organizations that have maybe dipped their toe in the water um, with it. Uh, um, gradually starting to roll it out or uh, maybe transitioning from third parties. So um, yeah, it'd be good just to get a, get a feel for, for where you're at. So I'll just wait, pause a moment um, whilst you submit. Thank you. I'm not sure. Great, thanks. We'll leave it. We'll leave it running, um, and it'll keep populating. But yeah, interesting that there's there's uncertainty there on on where you're at with that. And I know that we've got quite a mix today of um, roles, uh, professionals from IT, but also professionals from um, risk compliance, assurance roles. Uh, it'd be really interesting to see <clears throat> actually, uh, you know, the kind of perspectives around that uncertainty. Um, and and why there's that uncertainty as to kind of where where you're at with that journey. Um, but yeah, really interesting. Thank you. So I think yeah, with that in mind, um, and we've touched on we've touched on some of the aspects already. But we actually almost missed in preparing for this presentation the message of why. Uh, implement DLP. Why is it important? We we got and we often get a bit blinkered on how to do it and giving our guidance on how to do it. But actually, um, the why it seems quite obvious, but we often find ourselves working with organisations to build their business case for it to get um, elevate kind of leadership attention on DLP. Um, and it is important to to stop and capture your compelling reasons for deploying DLP and and get that view on on how far you've gotten um, in the process um, because it seems like there's perhaps some uncertainty there in the audience today so yeah it's important to understand why why you're investing this no doubt that you've got competing budget competing resource for this um, and also to kind of communicate yeah with leadership and also communicate with the user community um, when you start to hit them with DLP policies which we'll cover off a little bit later in this session so yeah the whole session is about getting this quick win of DLP um, so what's the win um, and what are the benefits for the IT function the assurance function the business at large of kind of plugging the holes in, in the damn wall by using DLP and the four kind of core areas of of wins that we see are um, firstly uh, and probably the most prevalent the barriers to malicious threats so you know we're in the content management game our clients are accumulating huge volumes of content and often that includes sensitive data high risk data high value data therefore they're vulnerable vulnerable to malicious attack um, from external sources but also potentially malicious activity from insiders um, so we we work with organisations who are um, looking to embark on tenant to tenant migrations, often in merger acquisition or, or sort of 
divestiture scenarios. It's a sensitive time and there's people moving, there's data moving, there's there's things going on in the organisation politically. And, um, you know, for example, that's a time that we, we often see um, DLP policies kind of ramp up. Um, and because if there is a breach, huge repercussions potentially for your organization in cleaning up that mess, in holding yourself accountable to your regulators, answering to your customers, answering to your suppliers, answering to the uh, data subjects involved, keeping your brand intact throughout that. And you know, DLP really enables you to sound that alarm at the point at which an attempt is being made to, for data to leave the organization or kind of just alerting you to patterns of activity that indicates something might be brewing. So, so that's definitely a, a critical area where there's a win to be made. Also preventing accidental loss. Um, we inadvertently lose data and make mistakes in the way that we move and manage our data as, as users of data and DLP can save organisations a lot of time and resource in, in kind of preventing any accidental data loss. A third area where there's a real clear win um, that Navasha has set the scene for is in regulatory compliance, you know, your obligation to uphold those standards um, that are demanding that you perform against audits, that you minimise your exposure, that you're taking action and, and evidencing that action um, as very sort of explicit requirements on you. And as we discussed in our last um, webinar that we ran in June, there's a big win to be made from aligning your controls with data privacy. So with GDPR, as Navasha mentioned, um, using Microsoft recommended controls that are all laid out for you um, in, in Microsoft uh, Compliance Center and DLP is a kind of fund fundamental part of that. And fourthly, um, you know, your competitive advantage as an organization might be very much tied up in how you attract and retain talent, how you stay ahead of the innovation curve, and, you know, how you embrace modern ways of working and, and modern technology. And yeah, you, you might need to offer flexible working, bring your own device, you know, promote internal and external collaboration, be uh, on the bleeding edge of technologies, be under pressure to really embrace AI uh, and, and manage knowledge. But you know, you need to do that responsibly and DLP is a very um, sort of foundational element of that. Therefore, a big contribution to that big win um, potentially in your competitive advantage. So, so, yeah, just to kind of paint a picture, therefore, of of the wins that you can um, achieve by um, putting foundations in place with DLP. But said that, you know, why is it we see so many organizations actually quite immature in protecting their sensitive data? You know, why is this um, gap between actually what the technology can do and the sophistication in sort of the art of the possible nowadays uh, in protecting data and the reality of what organizations have deployed or know they've deployed or don't know they've deployed, it would seem. Um, you know, what are, what are the barriers there? Why is that gap so wide? And these are some of the barriers that we see. So um, yeah, take it from the bottom, just to kind of explain what we mean. As as Johan mentioned, sort of the yeah the roots of of DLP are as a as kind of perimeter solution, and and I think it's traditionally been perceived as a sort of IT gig um, in deploying and managing that. But nowadays the bigger strategy just involves so much more input from the business um, and from assurance roles. IT can only get so far with it. Um, and we've definitely seen some kind of false starts where maybe that communication isn't open and highly functioning with the business with assurance functions um, to, to take DLP on and kind of mature it. Another barrier we see is a lack of visibility on risky data, on risky behaviour. Can't tell you how many times we hear the phrase, we don't know what we don't know. Um, you know, there's organisations who are just simply don't have that visibility on their their data and their requirements around it to take a lead on a kind of risk based approach to data loss prevention. You know, so they're perhaps not tackling the areas of highest priority, those honeypots of, of risky data because they don't have the visibility of them, um, you know, therefore not able to make the highest impact on deployment with things like 
week DLP. And that's, you know, that's where, as I mentioned earlier, we really, um, no matter where you are on your journey, we will typically start um, our professional services on, on the basis of a bit of an uh, assessment, a bit of a scan um, to help get a grip on, on where the risk lies and what's priority. Another barrier we see is this um, mindset shift that we've all been going on as we embrace Microsoft Cloud, where it's more of an ecosystem than um, silos of applications and kind of repositories of data. And it's it's really meant adjusting to the concept that things like data retention, things like data protection works at an item level and those governance controls and, and permissions follow that document and it's less about controlling the location of that item anymore and it's more about controlling the item and this mindset shift is certainly very important um, to have grasped and to have educated on within your organization if you um, or you've got colleagues chomping at the bit for um, AI solutions for example Copilot. Uh, and yeah the similar theme I I suppose is, is this barrier of managing change um, and understanding the um, the topics around DLP. Um, by design, DLP policies impact users and their behaviour around their day to day interactions with content. So any negative reactions to a deployment or, or any kind of pushback from change causes adoption to stall um, very frequently. And another barrier, um, just to finish off with, that we see um, is that those individuals who are often charged with implementing DLP aren't always armed with the definitions and the classifications of data that they need to flow down into the technology. And that might be because a taxonomy, a data classification taxonomy doesn't exist at all, or maybe there is one, but it hasn't really been brought to life within the context of um, Microsoft 365 and how um, labels work and how kind of uh, protection levels work. So it's not really fit for purpose and someone has to own that process of translating it into things um, like Microsoft Purview and sometimes there isn't that person or there isn't that person nominated to wear that hat for this um, period of time of, of implementation or there just isn't that process uh, to flow that down. So because this is a very, very common barrier, um, Navasha is going to give us some guidance now on how to um, how to smash it down really. Navasha, I hand to you. Tell me, do you want to take control or shall I click, keep clicking the slides for you? Um, I'm sharing and she'll can take control now, then we can drive it down. Oh, okay, cool. So we're going to There you go, Navasha. All over to you. Okay, I'm just waiting for it to come up on my side. I think we're all good there. Yep, we're all good. Hi again, everyone. So I think we've been we've been discussing this a few times, but I just want to set the scene again as we as we proceed with um, landing your data classification techno taxonomy. Uh, we've seen in recent years the significant increases in volumes of data and greater connectivity and mobility, especially I would say in the last three years with with many companies, you know, employing work from home um, and modern work solutions like Johan took us through earlier as well. So in addition, though, regulatory bodies have also started increasing the way they seek to protect um, an individual's right to data privacy. And in the face of things like substantial fines um, and reputational damage because it's no longer just about the money it's about the impact it has to your brand to your reputation um, organizations are feeling this immense pressure to discover and protect their, their valuable data especially personal data across extremely vast um, data landscapes multi-geographic uh, locations with data centers, et cetera. However, um, not all data is equal in terms of sensitivity and risk. Therefore, it's become even more critical for organizations um, to appropriately classify and label their data to ensure adequate and consistent protection. So Cloud Essentials have taken it upon, well, we've taken it upon ourselves um, to create a, a framework 
or, or, or a phased approach to how you should go about building your data classification taxonomy. And if you're familiar with us, um, we quite enjoy having phases or steps just to help break that down um, for our clients so that they're able to, to, with our help, navigate this process. Or if you're going at it alone, provide you some guidance um, along the way. So data classification as a whole, so let's just get our technology, our, our um, definitions out, is a specialized term used in the fields of cybersecurity and information governance, as we know, to describe the process of identifying, categorizing, and protecting content according to its sensitivity or impact level. In its most basic form, uh, data classification is a means of protecting your data from unauthorized disclosure, alteration, or destruction based on how sensitive or impactful it is. So there's often a lack of understanding as to the, sheer, the, the extreme importance of having these policies that inform and drive your classification te uh, taxonomy. So core to the DLP functionality is identifying the sensitive information that requires protection. One of the ways to identify sensitive information that is unique um, to your organization um, and that might be stored or is stored within your Microsoft 365 ecosystem is by classifying and labeling the data using Microsoft sensitivity labels. However, using sensitivity labels effectively requires that the organization's information be categorized and classified based on its sensitivity and risk. So our approach really seeks to assess, uh, or this approach rather, really seeks to assess the organization's information and gather supporting information that's essential for configuring things like sensitivity labels, DLP policies, or other Microsoft compliance technologies that Johan will take you through later. So as I said, our approach is broken up into five distinct phases, and all of them are designed to be an interactive process, the results of which will uh, which I intended to ultimately support a variety of your organization's data, data governance um, efforts. And I see like the question in the chat about that engagement. So you'll see we cover things like how do you go about with that consultation phase even during your classification taxonomy process. So let's get into it. So if you look at phase one, um, it's really your review process. So with this, you, we, we ask that if you're the person that's in charge of putting together your data classification taxonomy, ask around. So check with your business as to what work has been done already. Are there perhaps existing taxonomies? It might not cover your whole organization, but it might cover specific systems or specific departments. So are there maybe data infrastructure charts or data management policies that could help drive the creation of DLP and sensitivity labels? It's really about creating an action plan from what you might already have in existence. Our phase two is if you don't have all of that stuff. So if you've looked around and yes, we're starting from scratch um, and that might be the reality for many people on this call. Our phase two is your gather phase. So here you're really seeking to gain visibility on what to protect and why. So really trying to understand your legal and regulatory context but also doing a functional assessment. So this is usually achieved by questionnaires or interviews with stakeholders, or you could engage with Cloud Essentials or a consulting firm to help you with this step and you know the, the next phases, uh, phases to come. So the types of questions asked in this phase ultimately get rolled up into your taxonomy. So some of the examples of questions we would ask would be, what type of data do you handle in your team? How sensitive is the data you handle? Are you aware of the legal and regulatory requirements for handling the data? So here we're seeking to both understand your understanding or the team's understanding of what they feel they need to protect and what they feel they have that needs protecting. And then we can then we move on to phase three, which again is extremely important. Um, whether you're dealing with our general cloud essentials methodology or our data classification taxonomy approach. It's this collaboration phase or this consultation phase. So this phase really the objective of it is to ensure you're engaging with the right people to start this framework. 
So it's involved. So what you what you need to do is identify and collab and ensure you're collaborating with the correct stakeholders to take into account both your business requirements and regulatory requirements into your taxonomy framework. Engaging the right stakeholders helps you avoid a number of the barriers for adoption that we identified earlier. Our phase four is our workshopping phase. So here we, we really uh, talk about bringing this taxonomy to life, because I think in the other phases, we're talking about creating a taxonomy. Uh, we're talking about consulting on it, or you know, how do we inform this? And our phase four is really this creation phase and, uh, and bringing all the information we've got across our different phases and aligning that and assigning things like roles and responsibilities, uh, identifying the processes that need to go into your taxonomy. Because it's not enough, as we all know, to have a policy or to have technology that don't speak to each other uh, or have users who aren't aware of this, that process or that technology. So in this phase, it's really about bringing it to life ensuring that we align roles and responsibilities, identify the relevant process to get ready for the implementation um, of controls as required by your data classification technology uh, taxonomy, such as getting technology ready. Um, and there we could see um, that things like the adoption of Microsoft Purview. And last but definitely not least, because just like with everything risk and compliance related, there's always room for improvement. These are working documents. Um, you know, you're expected to review and update and monitor these things. But our phase five is delivering. So here your, your overall objective is implementing controls and finalizing the rollout of that documented personal data classification taxonomy schedule and implementing your controls again that cover people, process and technology. This phase should also make provision for the creation of new labels or technology enhancements as you go along. Um, what we've put together here is an example of a taxonomy and in our experience we have found that a classification taxonomy can roll into maybe four or five sensitivity classifications. So for example, uh, with an organization, you might in do your engagements with uh, your tax team, your legal team, HR, finance, and everyone has, everyone else thinks their requirements might be more important than the next, or that they're very different to the next. But actually, once you break those down, they actually all roll into the same type of protection requirements. So for, for example, um, one type of um, sensitivity classification I'd use here is like highly, highly confidential access restricted. So that might be one type, but it might mean different things to different, uh, or it might mean one thing to finance and it might mean something else to HR, but the classification level still does the same thing, uh, which speaks to, I think what Johanna and Laura said earlier about the protection living with that document. So correctly applying the right level of data classification can be complex in real life situations and may sometimes overwhelm users. So the importance of data, that's the important, therefore there's this need for, for a data classification policy. Having this policy and standard um, helps a, a user to um, define and guide their daily work. And Last but definitely not least, um, some of the stakeholders that we believe or we recommend be part of your journey if you're going at it alone um, is assure your assurance teams, your technical teams and your business owners. Um, on that note, let's move to Johan. We'll show you how to get cracking with your DLP journey. Thank you very much, Nivasha. So as a starting point, just to cover off a couple of key features that's included with Microsoft Private Data Loss Prevention, where Microsoft has made a lot of investment into expanding the services and capabilities of this solution from the early days of being linked to Exchange Online and a perimeter-based defense and control of your data. At this current state, Microsoft has included data loss prevention capabilities into your endpoint devices, but then also importantly into your non-Microsoft SaaS applications and also on-premise 
legacy type repository like file shares and NAS storage locations. What Microsoft Purview Data Loss Prevention enables you to do is to have a unified and flexible management and control spanning all of these locations and not requiring third parties and separation of investments to control your data across these different locations. Um, it, it also includes the same um, user experience and, and interactions that you'll see um, in the upcoming demo section across these states where the alerts and their the the user guidance that you built into the data loss provision policies um, appears similarly across all these locations. So really embedding your user onboarding training and adoption of these, um, these solutions to not only um, empower your users to understand why you are uh, implementing some of these controls, but also guiding them on the regulatory and compliance requirement for these data loss prevention mechanisms. So starting off, I'm going to show you what data loss prevention um, from Purview entails for the admin side of it. So obviously, as you are aware, Microsoft Purview data prevention is part of the Purview compliance stack. Um, if you scroll down to the data loss prevention section in the Purview Admin Center, the first view you get is the overview section. Already here, Microsoft has built a powerful dashboard that without any policies defined, provide you suggestions and insights of sensitive information that is in your existing tenant that you can use to then implement templatized data loss prevention policies to address these risks um, to block the holes in the dam, as Laura suggested earlier. If you click into the details section, you can see the locations and the sensitive information types that it is in your tenant currently um, that you can then use to design your risk-based approach for implementing these data loss prevention policies. And with the right permissions, you can delve they deeper down into the Content Explorer to confirm that the actual sensitive information types that was identified is actually um, the right ones that you want to address. Once you've implemented data loss prevention policies, you can track the activities and the alerts of the data loss prevention policies and where it has been triggered across your estate. If you click on then the view all activities button at the bottom, you get a detailed view in the activity explorer of each of the data loss prevention rule and activity that was triggered. We use this view uh, along with reporting to really delve into the success criteria of each policy as we move in to improve and mature the data loss prevention policy. That workflow we'll discuss in the upcoming section just now. So the technical team doesn't have any content specific detail. They can see on the right hand side, if they click on a single data loss prevention activity, they can get some of the information around the activity, but none of the actual sensitive information that triggered um, the, the alert to occur. If we go back to the overview page, that actually happens and can be controlled within the alerts view. So with each data loss prevention policy, you can configure alerts to be sent to your data and security teams for further investigations. And they'll have access to this dashboard where they can then click on an alert to get more information on each of these rules and triggers that occurred with a data loss prevention policy. If you they click on view more details, they'll be directed into the Defender Central Alert dashboard where they can dive into more detail of each of these alerts. They can see the same general activity of who triggered the alert to which party it was attempted to be shared and general alerting information. But I think most critically on the right hand side, your security and compliance team has the ability to assign investigations of these alerts 
to the data risk and risk teams for further investigation and actions, whether the action incurs user um, education or further investigation if the risk is of the critical level. Um, each of these assigned users will then have the ability to go into the alert to get the relevant information that they'll use as part of the investigation. If you they then click on the events button at the top of the alert, they'll actually get the view of the specific sensitive information types and um, detail of the content that, that triggered the alert. On the, they'll click on the classifiers and there they'll get the breakdown, as I mentioned, of each of the sensitive information types that was picked up within the content when it was attempted to, to be shared outside. The right hand column also provides context of the sensitive information type so that they have more context of the investigation. Then they also have the ability to download the actual email so that they can use it for the investigation and also to classify it as not being a match to then further enhance and imp improve the data loss prevention um, policies. So that's it from an overview of the data prevention from an administrative perspective. Really powerful using it throughout the implementation journey of your data loss prevention policies. But also today, I want to include the actual view that users will see with implemented the data loss prevention policies to show you the unified experience that they'll have across the different applications. So starting off with uh, the, an email. So here I'm logged on as a user. And if I attempt to send an email containing sensitive information, I'll get some useful information around the risk. So if I click on new email and choose a individual I want to send out um, to externally, for example, I have resigned and I want to send some sensitive um, privileged information to myself that I'm going to take to my new employer. Um, I type in an email to myself and in the body of the email, I paste some information that contains account and credit card information of some of our existing clients. Right at the top, you'll see I get a policy tip that this is in breach of the organization policy, which the text can be customized to be more informative to your end users. So you can specify exactly which policy um, you are the user currently in breach of. And if they hover over policy tips, Microsoft provides them the information around the sensitive information types that they have um, placed into the email and why the restriction have applied to the, the email. For the, the detailed content people, you'll see we also implemented sensitive information types and automated policies within our tenant. And because we pasted sensitive information types, which included credit card information, the internal use sensitive label was also applied to this content, meaning it can't be shared externally from a content management perspective also. The policy that we have here is very restrictive because of the amount of credit card information I'm trying to send, and it will completely block the email from being sent without any user overwrite. Again, you've got the ability to customize these user notifications and alerts and also give them access to a link that is not active in this demo environment, but to a page on your internet that contains policies that they can then use to further educate themselves. Each of the applications, as I mentioned at the start, has got a similar experience. So within Teams, if you paste a chat, chat, a chat message containing sensitive information types, the chat message will not be submitted and they'll get an alert within Teams and within their email why the message was being blocked. And if configured within the data location policy, they have the ability to then overwrite it with a reason um, to then actually submit 
the or get the, the message delivered. Um, quite useful if it is sensitive information type that is approved to be shared with external collaborative parties within a, a team, um, a project team environment. Quite useful um, is the integration into endpoint devices and application level controls where content within the office applications and documents can also be controlled. So you can't within this sensitive and controlled document, as an example, copy any content from it um, because the data supervision policy has restricted the activities at an application or, or um, at, a, at a, a capability level rather than a blanket control in this instance. You can also then with data provision policy and the integration into endpoint limit even the control of copying data to removal storage or on-premise locations. So really um, preventing your crown jewels and sensitive content from being maliciously copied to unsupported storage locations. And lastly, a similar experience you'll see if you integrate data provision policies into controlling SaaS platforms where uploading content to these cloud storage locations will be blocked based on your protection policies. So the next, we at Cloud Essentials developed a real um, strategy around rolling out, a useful strategy around rolling out data loss provision policies in a fast but sustainable method. We have seen too frequently some of our clients rush and implement data loss provision controls within the IT department um, where it was um, the legacy area of implementing data loss provision policy and then bringing the business to a grinding halt by enforcing some of these restrictions and controls. And in that instance, losing the, the trust of business um, disabling data resolution policies and really needing to take months and months to reconvince the business that Microsoft Preview data loss prevention policies is uh, a, a usable feature within the purview state. But using our data loss prevention policy deployment approach, we have seen again and again the success um, of implementing this using this rollout and adoption plan. So it starts off with enabling DLP policies, not shying away from utilizing the Microsoft templates that's available to all tenants, even from the baseline licenses. So data loss provision within purview is not a solution that requires the E5 or the highest SKU licenses. Most clients and most organizations on the base E3 and business premium or business standard licenses can utilize a flavor of data loss prevention within these environments. But we always encourage clients to implement these data loss prevention policies in monitoring mode initially, and then move on to actually using that dashboard, as I showed earlier, to monitor the results, go into the detail of are we having thousands and thousands of false positives and remediating and reviewing each of these policies and rules, adjusting the thresholds, adjusting the sensitive information types that is triggering these rules. And then as a last step, enforcing the policies, enforcing the controls that is within these policies and policy templates. But the same as most purview and security solutions, it's not a implement and forget based solution. If these policies needs to go into a continuous loop of monitoring the results, getting your security and the data risk teams to investigate these alerts, then respond back to IT of adjustments that is required to be done on these controls within the purview environment, um, where then they make the adjustments and reconfirm and reapply the enforcement actions. Once you've been through the first iteration and you mature into ongoing improvement actions, there's also the ability to ramp up your protection over time as you go into this continuous loop of improvement. 
These includes, as I mentioned, we can adjust the thresholds, how many credit card numbers, how many instances of a sensitive information type will actually trigger an alert, um, and also maybe potentially um, have more granular rules where it starts off with just user education before it just be a hard block um, so that you actually benefit from just user education more. But you can also then expand all the controls and features within each of the data life information policy, improving the actions, improving the encryption levels that is applied to each of the content within each policy. And as I mentioned initially, you can integrate into um, insider risk management from data life prevention policy, and it's a feature called adaptive protection, adaptive prediction that Microsoft has released. What that really allows you to do is to utilize the different levels of user risk within insider risk management and trigger different levels of controls within data loss prevention policies. Where an example, user with minor risk or low risk score, they will have a lower controlling or lower limitation um, data loss prevention policy applied to them, where if they can copy sensitive content like a credit card or like personal information into email, they'll just get policy tips with no enforcements. But as their user risk score increases in insider risk management, more stricter and more controlling factors is applied to them now, where the highest then being if they are high risk or elevated risk, they have initiated a resignation you can then trigger dynamically the data loss prevention policy to block any external um, content containing sensitive data to be um, submitted from your or be, um, be shared from these users out of your organization. Then lastly, as I've mentioned before, the use of expanding into a more granular and more advanced controls and configuration in data version policy includes then user education. And that's why we feel that communication to end users during, before, and after implementing data version policy within Microsoft Purview is very important um, to reiterate it the fact uh, that they understand why exactly these controls are implemented, but also what they can take to, to, in, to improve their actions. Uh, Nivasha, do you want to finish around the education from a steer code perspective before we wrap up today? Yeah, sure. I think um, tone at the top is used uh, like a catchphrase these days. Um, well, for the past few years, but it's so important to create this this tone at the top uh, or have this tone at the top, which really means ensuring that as at an exco level there is this culture of privacy and security, because that really flows down into mitigating things like the consequences of non-compliance. It 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 informs and leverages or informs technology strategy. It ensures that we utilize change management strategies. Um, and I know Laura alluded that to this earlier as well, ensuring that data privacy champions are empowered um, to correctly go out and help implement things like your data classification uh, policies or, or become a champion to, you know, to discuss DLP and the effects on someone's daily work life. So we really wanted to reiterate how important um, having that uh, that tone at the top and setting that through right from Exco uh, moving down in your compliance and technology journey. Back to you, Laura. Thanks, Nivasha. Thanks, Johan. Yeah, so just to bring um, the session to a close, hopefully we've given you some food for thought from a kind of strategic perspective with Microsoft Purview, but also a bit more familiar familiarization from a, a technical level as well. If you leave with anything, um, leave with these do's and don'ts. Do get cracking with DLP, get that quick in um, with what you've got from Microsoft. Um, but in tandem with that, do think bigger um, about how you get more value from um, Purview and the whole kind of feature set um, and over what timeline and, and how kind of progressive you want to be with it. Do go big on user communication, um, as Navasha and Johan have just uh, have just mentioned. Not just what's happening, but why um, why it's happening to to really curb any negative reactions. 
don't put off building your classification taxonomy. Um, that work flows into so many things that then um, are critical to expanding your adoption. Um, so yeah, don't delay getting a grip on that, um, even if it seems maybe an overwhelming task. And don't go it alone, you know, as, as an IT function, as a governance function, as a compliance function, um, or don't go it alone when you've got knowledgeable partners like Cloud Essentials who've gone through these challenges and so can uh, hopefully support you and save you a bit of trouble as you go through um, your DLP deployment. So um, also to add into there from, uh, you know, the, the feedback that we've got, do go and find out, go and find out where you're at with your purview adoption, who's been working on what, maybe in silos, you know, and what your part to play is, is perhaps in accelerating that. So if you want to know more from us, um, you can subscribe to our content, get in touch with us. We run uh, regular roadmap sessions um, in a kind of just consultative way, no obligation around them, just to see um, where you're at with, with purview adoption and and give some kind of food for thought um, as to where you might go forward from there. And you can catch up on the series that we've run um, from our, our website as well.